Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have you. Um, I would like to welcome you to the fourth and last webinar of the fall 2020 series, which we are hosting to kick off the Investing in the Future of Child Care Initiative. This is an initiative sponsored by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, the SF Fed, and the Low Income Investment Fund, or LIF, to address the challenges related to the child care market and the investments and partnerships needed to support early childhood educators. In the past webinars, we've heard perspectives from the banking and finance sector, a chamber of commerce, workforce boards, a United Way, a union, as well as researchers. All of their voices have made a strong case for public philanthropic and business involvement and support for ECE in order to have thriving communities and vibrant neighborhoods. My name is Angie Garling. I'm the National Director for Early Care and Education at the Low Income Investment Fund. And I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, which is fo focused on the integration of childcare into housing and other community facilities. This is a very timely discussion for us as LIF, at LIF as we are launching our new strategic plan, which is centered on a deep commitment to social justice and racial equity. We're focusing our efforts over this period on growing our impact in three key areas, impact lending, affordable housing, and early care and education. We know that families are most likely to access early care and education where they live. Therefore, we must address the challenges of sustaining and expanding the quality and number of early care and education facilities in diverse communities. These include rural areas and lower income census tracts where we have even less supply of childcare than higher income areas. Today, we're gonna to talk about how and why we should include childcare facilities as a component of community development projects to promote family-oriented cities and neighborhoods. This is not a new idea. In fact, it's been around for years, but still a lot of work still needs to be done to ensure that early care and education programs can be co-developed along with other types of facilities. Our panelists today are gonna to talk about opportunities and challenges in this area. They're gonna tell us the stories behind how these developments and collaborations came together, the value of co-locating childcare with other uses to support family needs, the challenges inherent in co-location and how to address these challenges. I'd like to say a bit about our panelists because we have a really great group of experts and leaders, including Juanita Salinas Aguila, Program Director for Early Learning at Enterprise Community Partners, Inc. Juanita will share an overview of the Home and Hope Initiative in the state of Washington, which focuses on co-developing childcare and housing. Then we'll hear from Susan Neufeld, Vice President of Evaluation and Resident Program Design at Bridge Housing, where she oversees more than 350 resident programs and services that are currently offered at Bridge Properties. She will share with us a little bit, a little bit of Bridge's history, including how Bridge Housing became a champion for co-location and the challenges they've been facing in promoting co-location. Then we'll hear from Kristen Anderson, who as a child care planner, consultant and author has developed childcare policies and strategies for public and private agencies for over 30 years. Kristen will share project examples, including some transit oriented ones and highlight what made those projects successful and next steps and recommendations to make projects more fe feasible. And then finally, we'll hear from Kerry Yurosevich, who is the lead for network design and innovation at Hawaii's Early Childhood Action Strategy. Carrie has a story about a recent ECE legislative success in Hawaii, which includes co-locating public pre-K with libraries and museums. Before we move to our presentations, I would like to share a short video featuring one of LIFT's grantees, Donna Mason, who is the Executive Director at St. Albans Early Childhood Center in Washington, DC. Let me show that video. People think that if I pay the childcare center, I'm paying for services. No, you're really paying for space too. Because if you don't pay for this space, we won't be here. It's not, it's not just about paying for services. We're already doing the services. We're doing as much as we can. But it's just not the way people think. Great. Thanks. I think Donna did a great job of setting the stage for us regarding the importance of facilities as a crucial component of early care and education. So next, I'd like to pose 
uh, two polling questions. And I'm going to cue that up right now. We'd love to hear what kind of early care and education setting you had for yourself when you were a child. Okay, I'm gonna share the results there. Many of you didn't actually attend childcare. So this is something that we're thinking about in modern times where the majority of uh, the people who have young children are actually in the workforce. So this is a, a very current problem that we need to make sure that we're addressing. So the second thing I'm gonna do is gonna to go to the next polling question, which just gives us a sense of uh, who we have on our webinar today. So it looks like we have uh, a good diversity of folks today, a large number of folks from nonprofit and community-based organizations, um, as well as government, CDFI, ECE providers. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Following today's events, just a few logistics, you will receive an email with a link to the recording of today's webinar and the past three webinars. The email will also include a link to the survey, which we hope you will take time to complete to let us know what you thought about the event and what topics we should cover in the future. We always like to encourage the use of social media, so please engage with us using hashtag investing in childcare. Let's get started with today's discussion. Please ask your questions in the Q&A or chat box during the presentations and we will respond following all the presentations. So first, let's turn it over to Juanita. Thank you, Angie. I'm really happy to be here today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can I get a verbal cue that, that's visible? Yeah. Thank you. All right, so thanks for um, first and foremost for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm really excited to share a little bit more about our work in co-location um, at Enterprise Community Partners. As mentioned, my name is Juanita Salinas. I work at Enterprise Community Partners, uh, really focused on early learning programming. Uh, Enterprise Community Partners is a nonprofit that has offices nationwide. We work out of our Seattle offices in Washington State. And I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about our initiative called Home and Hope, which is really focused on creating early learning and affordable housing together. What I'll do is I'll briefly share an overview of how this vision really came to be, um, how we really got funding started for this work, and we'll be sharing a couple of the key examples of co-location projects in our region. So how did this vision come to be? Um, a number of years ago, our previous market leader, M.A. Leonard, was really working at addressing the gap in affordable housing within King County in Washington State. And she was working very closely with Mary Jean Ryan, who was the executive director of Community Center for Education Results. And Mary Jean really shined a light on the fact that Washington State is, was, and for many years now, has been facing an extreme shortage of childcare availability for children in Washington. Um, more than anything, uh, even with the lack of slots, we really were lacking in actual classroom and space. And so them two together really looking at these two parallel gaps that King County was facing, the lack of affordable housing and the lack of access to childcare spaces. At the same time, uh, MA was working with Frank Chop, who was then the Speaker of the House, and they were getting together to really think about how to use public sites and how to use them for housing community facilities and early learning. So while these partnerships and connections and um, discoveries, were, discoveries were being made, James Madden came on board to Enterprise to help lead some of these efforts. He comes from Boston and has a rich his, um, experience in affordable housing. He is now our market leader since MA's retirement. And, and James came on board in 2017, was able to secure some initial funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which helped seed the Home and Hope work, which ultimately its purpose is the, to advance the development of affordable housing and early childhood education centers on underutilized tax exempt sites owned by public agencies and nonprofits. And so the first piece of work that Enterprise really embarked on is to put together a, a how-to guide that we call our Home and Hope Packet. And this how-to guide was really a result of a convening from local housing developers, architects, 
childcare providers, public funders who had already successfully created co-location projects in the region. And out of that convening, we really put together this guide on key strategies, best practices, challenges, partnerships to consider when someone wants to embark on a co-location project. We refer to this packet a lot in our work, especially when working with local developers who are interested in co-location. And I highly recommend anyone who's interested um, in reading this, um, this is open and available for anyone who is, and I'll work with Angie to see if we can get this out after the webinar. Um, the key recommendations are listed on the slide of what we cover in this packet. And I think it's really a great tool to use to help get you started on thinking about what it takes to make co-location possible. So the process of really um, that came out of really doing this research, we were really looking at um, collaborating with so local um, state politicians, uh, representatives to really support our work. And that's when we began working with Representative Ruth Kagi, who was really a champion in early learning. She had spent many years advocating uh, for ch children and families in Washington state. And in the 2017-18 legislative session, we worked with her to draft a bill to help get funding for early learning facilities develop, uh, development specifically. And we were able to pass that bill. And what we did is create a two-pronged approach um, that would include funding for uh, an early learning facilities grant that folks could apply for and access throughout the state to help build new child care centers. And the second piece would be a CDFI portion. We brought uh, two partners in to help promote that work, the Washington Community Reinvestment Association and CRAFT3, um, to help think about how can we also provide financing al alongside a grant program for early learning facilities. So our, which has the CDFI portion, which I'll cover briefly right now, created um, in, launched in January in 2020, we now call our Washington Early Learning Loan Fund or WELL Fund for short. And this is really um, a partnership between Enterprise, Craft3 and WCRA to provide financing for early learning providers and developers across Washington state. And since our launching, um, we've been able to match those initial dollars that we received from the Department of Commerce, and we received some dollars from the Balmer Group, the Seattle Foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to help start that loan fund. Since January, we've been able to um, finance and close five deals. We've been able to offer several grants, um, which has resulted in 53 new classrooms and 500 new child care slots. And so thinking about our Home and Hope initiative, really one uh, arm of it is the WELL Fund to provide that financing. And we work closely with the Department of Commerce to help um, execute the grant, the sister grant program that matches that. And on the other arm, we have our site feasibility work, which is led by an amazing architect that we have on staff that provides technical assistance, feasibility, due diligence for affordable housing and early learning community facilities. And I, that is my one minute mark. So I'm going to move to cover two really great local examples of co-location in our region. Um, the first one is El Centro de la Raza Plaza Roberto Maestas. El Centro is a nonprofit that runs 43 community programs and social services. And for many years, they were um, running an, a child care center out of the white building on the left of the picture they decided to embark on creating affordable housing on the land that they owned, which is the building on the right. It includes 112 units. They have retail and office space and a public plaza. And it's located across the street from a, our local uh, link station. So it is a, a transportation development oriented development. And they currently offer seven operating early learning classroom. And for us, Speaking from someone who's from the Seattle area, I did grow up attending El Centro's community events. So this is a key example of um, a co-location project that is built by and used by the community. Our second example, and I might go a little over, so I'm almost done, <laughs> um, is our uh, 
Love and Mercy Magnuson Place. Magnuson is located on a local park that includes lots of trails and very, very quick access to bus lines and access to the University of Washington in downtown Seattle. This is um, a location that offers 148 units of studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedrooms for families. Um, here in the center, this white building is a 1700 square foot child care center, which is operated by Denise Louis Education Center, six classrooms of infant, preschool and toddler aged children. There's also a health clinic on site here, operated by Na Neighbor Care Health. Um, this is a great um, example that not only offers an early learning piece, but a community support program clinic. Um, this is an award-winning location and so um, also a great example of co-location. So that was a very, very quick overview of our Home and Hope initiative. I'm more than happy to connect with anyone who would like to have continued conversations about our Home and Hope work, um, some of the challenges we face, but also the continued success and projects that we are currently working on. So thank you so much. Thank you, Juanita. I love how you show those great pictures of those wonderfully co-located projects and then told a little bit about what are some of the ingredients for success. So thank you so much. And uh, please don't forget to put any questions for Juanita in the question and answer section. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Susan Newfeld with Bridge Housing. Great, hi. Uh, I am going to share my screen. So hi, my name is Susan Neufeld and I am the uh, Vice President of Evaluation and Resident Program Design with Bridge Housing. And really what I'm gonna focus on in today's talking points is a little bit more about why an affordable houser would invest in on-site childcare and co-location and also share a little bit more about what we're learning from a houser and operator perspective. Before I dive in, I wanna give a little bit of background. Uh, Bridge Housing is an affordable housing nonprofit developer that was founded in 1983 with the primary mission of building quality and affordable housing at a large scale. And our specialty really is in high cost coastal markets. And today we're uh, throughout Oregon, California, and Washington. And we have currently over 12,000 units that serve 31,000 residents across 115 properties. So we're quite large and growing very quickly. Within our portfolio, we have family uh, properties, we have senior properties, as well as a growing portfolio of supportive housing. And then uh, for those of you who are not familiar with affordable housing, I just want to clarify that affordable housing really is a term that means that a household is spending 30% uh, or less of its income on the cost of housing. And for many of us who live in the Bay Area or Los Angeles or Seattle or Portland, we know that this can be a real challenge, that housing costs are very expensive. And just to give you a little anchor on that, um, across our portfolio, the average family income at our family properties is $31,950 a year. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because part of the second mission of Bridge or the second mission of Bridge is to leverage our real estate to serve the residents both in the building and in the surrounding community. And one of the primary ways we've done that is through childcare. Across our portfolio, we currently have 10 child care centers that have over 400 slots, 300 of which are full-time preschool slots. And we have six more child care centers in planning. So we really do have a strong organizational commitment to co-locating child care within our affordable housing wherever possible. And I'll just share real quick that this image is at North Beach Place, which is in the um, North Beach neighborhood of San Francisco, and it is one of our oldest uh, child care centers that's operated by Kai Ming. So one of the reasons uh, we care about child care is fundamentally, we want to serve our community, our residents, and we want to make sure that we're providing supports and opportunities to disrupt generational poverty. And I think that's a really important point um, for us. Within the United States, education is still the number one way to get out of generational poverty. And at Bridge Housing, we view childcare spaces as critical for that. 
We also understand that a lot of our families are working and need some supports within um, with their child care. And it's, it's such a critical need for all families in California, Oregon, and Washington, but in particular working families. Um, and then there are other reasons that have to do with the asset that we, we build. What we've learned is that um, it's important to have community serving retail, that that can really activate the buildings in which we're located and really improve the, the sense of safety and sense of quality um, of experience and life in the neighborhood. It activates the community. We've learned that the presence of children on site brings a positive energy to the community and actually can improve some of the neighboring relationships that we see among residents. Um, Kai Ming, which you see here, is actually a really great illustration of this. The play area is in the center of a courtyard and all most of the apartments face this courtyard. And so residents get to hear and see children pretty much every day that the, the, day, the child care center is open. And we find that that really improves quality of life. And then the last thing, of course, is that we are really eager to bring um, opportunities for equity and community development through our housing. Um, I will add, we just did a survey or completed a three-year survey. And what we learned is that the vast majority of our families are working in the service industry. So that includes things like waitressing, being a cook, working in housekeeping, um, working in retail. And we know that those schedules are really um, unpredictable and that childcare is a huge need for those industries. So we also feel like this is an opportunity to bring additional supports to working families so that they can earn their assets and, and grow their, um, their futures. That said, I'm going to also share that there are challenges. Um, and these are some of the things that we've learned along the way. It's really important to find a quality childcare provider who has a strong balance sheet and is committed to a sustainable relationship. Um, I always say that doing work with childcare um, providers is a little bit of a balancing act because we um, really want to activate the retail space. Um, but in our experience, we've had a couple of situations where childcare providers didn't have strong balance sheets and they either can't fill the space or the space closes. And then as the owner, we're left with an empty retail space, which is actually the worst possible outcome. And so when we're getting into a relationship, we've learned to have early and frequent conversations with childcare providers so that we make sure that we're aligned in our vision and mission and that we all have the strength to make it happen. The other challenge is the space challenge. Um, we work in urban environments and so, and it's a lot of infill. And so we've had to get very creative on how we use space and how we can um, get licensed for that space. Um, and usually, as you can imagine, it's the outdoor space that causes the biggest challenge, but we have found creative solutions. For example, we're currently finalizing a building in the mission area of San Francisco where we're going to have our outdoor space on the roof. Um, trust me, we're gonna have lots of fences, but it is one way we're trying to deal with um, the unique needs of, of childcare. The last thing I will add is that we are learning um, that we have to do a lot of financial planning and not just in the current construct of a new uh, childcare space, but really in the long range planning. And um, what I will share with you is that construction costs are only growing at an astronomical rate. And because a uh, affordable housing development can sometimes take two to four years to come into fruition, we're learning how to work with childcare providers to really do pro formas that create a cost escalator over four or five years. Um, again, at the time of planning, everyone may have a sense of what the costs are and may have the resources to build the childcare space. But by the time we get into actualizing the building, those construction costs may have um, gone up by 33%. And so that's something that we're learning to be very thoughtful and very careful about. The last thing I will add is um, we want to make sure that we have a good understanding of what the operating plan is. Um, because this is housing and it is where people live and we do have a maintenance crew and a custodial crew, having time to work out all of those negotiations of who's going to maintain the space, 
What happens when the little toilets overflow? What happens when there's um, materials that need to be cleaned up on the outdoor space? Those kinds of discussions, they sound pretty basic, but they really are important to having a strong relationship over the long term. I just got my bell, so I'm trying to speed this up. And I'll just end by saying, um, this is a, another picture of Kai Ming Preschool in North Beach Place. I have to say, this is one of my absolute favorite childcare spaces at Bridge, in part because they do one of, they are one of the few Cantonese English dual language programs that I know about. And what I love about this site is how they use the space. Um, in the center courtyard, they are surrounded by apartments and there is a senior um, building and a family building. And what Kaiming has done is figured out how to invite some of the seniors to volunteer in the space. And they actually have what they call a resident grandparent who is a resident of the low income part apartments who comes to the childcare and interacts with kids um, and provides them with an extended sense of family. This is just one little operational outcome of what can happen when you co-locate childcare in affordable housing, but we think it's enriching the lives of both residents and children for generations to come. And I'll stop there and again, share my information. Happy to talk to anyone who has any questions. The last thing I'll say is um, I'm excited about the guidebook that Enterprise has. Bridge also published a guidebook over 20 years ago. So our information is probably a little more stale than what you can find at Enterprise, but there's still a lot of good stuff in that guidebook and it is available at the Bridge Housing website. Thank you. Great, right. thank you so much, Susan. I love how you um, included good visual examples of how children are using the space and uh, the, the, dual, the dual generational um, impact of having senior senior folks working and volunteering in the classroom. So next we're going to go to Kristen Anderson. Kristen. Um, so families need several things in their communities in order to thrive, including housing, employment, transportation, schools, childcare, parks, and much more. For many working parents, childcare is critically linked to home, work, and transportation between. So co-location of those uses has functional benefits, but it also has financial benefits. Okay. Um, so childcare programs don't generate enough rent of revenue to pay for facilities, and there's a lack of public infrastructure funding for facilities. So there's a need to, from the childcare point of view to partner and access other public and private sources used for community development activities. Vacant or underutilized public agency land and buildings are also another resource. Limited public sources for operations, such as from Federal Head Start or State Preschool, um, may not exist in many communities, even to serve low-income families. In California, the access to operational subsidies is not guaranteed when a facility is available in a low-income neighborhood. So when you think about the projects that Susan mentioned, the three to four year or more timeline, that makes it additionally difficult. Um, so I'm gonna also share some examples of co-location from around California. This small project is in a low-income neighborhood in Santa Cruz and it incorporated various public and private uses. A larger transit-oriented affordable housing project at the Fruitvale BART station in Oakland also houses a large Head Start program, legal services center, a charter high school, a senior center, a branch library, a health clinic, and small retail spaces. This affordable apartment building in San Francisco includes a small center and two rental units for licensed family child care homes. While family child care homes are by law an allowable use in all residential properties in California, locating and designing them in a way that supports provision of care is ideal. 
It's not an easy model though, for various reasons. This project was built on an underutilized transit authority parking lot in San Jose with 194 apartments. It also includes a community center, computer lab, and adjacent retail space. The child care center is a single story building in the middle of the two to three story apartment complex. Child care has also been built at transit stations or hubs. Many years ago, Los Angeles area's Metrolink system developed child care facilities at several stations, including this one in Montclair. So some of the factors that contribute to the success of projects like this include, most importantly, the awareness and leadership of local officials and planners. Public and private partnerships are essential and usually multiple funding sources are needed. Land use and other policy support, uh, directing and redirecting resources such as uh, land buildings and funding and reducing requirements to enable facility development. I wanna talk briefly about the importance of local leadership Redwood City with approximately 85,000 residents has been a leader on childcare for a few decades, as you can see from this list. The level of awareness and commitment to childcare is high and several facilities have been built or are in the pipeline. The development agreement negotiated a decade ago for Stanford's administrative campus extension expansion in Redwood City included an on-site childcare that opened last fall. This is Arroyo Green, a senior affordable housing project with about 8,000 square feet of childcare space on the ground floor. City land and funds contributed to the financing of this mid-pen housing development. It's under construction now to be completed next spring. Working with the space allocated for the center has been difficult, highlighting the importance of having a childcare design expert involved from the beginning. This is one large mixed use project in the pipeline in Redwood City that will provide a large childcare facility for residents, office tenants and community use. A similar project with an 8,000 square foot child care facility will go for planning commission approval next Tuesday. Though the city has no requirement that developers help to address child care impacts of their projects, they are responsive to stated priorities of local leaders. Across San Mateo County, our Build Up for San Mateo County's Children initiative is successfully engaging several cities and developers to address facilities needs. While we can't fix locally other parts of the child care and early education system that are regional, state, and national issues such as the workforce shortage, community development and land use planning are under local purview where local officials and other advocates can make a difference. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, Kristen. I, I really love how Kristen showed these examples of how this can happen, how, how you can really get it done and where there are still, um, still barriers and other things that need to happen. I also appreciate how she talked about how important it is to get elected official champions. And that is something that we, we need to do you know, more often in our fields. We're doing a great job, but we need to do more. And then last but not least, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie Yurosevich. Carrie. How is that? Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you all so much for having me today. And aloha from Hawaii. Um, this is really inspiring because we're at the beginning stages. I'm looking at co-location. And so it's been great for us to hear uh, the three panelists before, um, before me. And I'm looking forward to following up with all of you um, to learn uh, from other states. So I'm Carrie Rosevich, and I am the lead for Network Design and Innovation with the Early Childhood Action Strategy. We're a collective impact um, effort uh, that 
works on the system of care for Hawaii's youngest children, or keiki. You'll hear me use that language throughout the presentation, um, and families. We started in 2012 within the Executive Office of Early Learning um, up in Governor Abercrombie's office. Um, and we stayed in state government for about four years, and then we pulled the effort out of state government. Um, but we still work very closely with all of our government partners. Um, just a little bit of background on Hawaii's keiki and, and children birth to five. So we have about 108,000 children. 50% um, of those, which is relative, relative to the topic today, are three and four-year-olds, or 50% of our three and four-year-olds um, have access to early learning. Um, another 50% do not, which is why this bill that I'll be sharing about today was so critical. Um, about 95% of our keiki are actually served through community-based or private programs versus our public programs like Head Start and our public pre-K program. And then total capacity of our licensed childcare slots is just at 23.3% of the total population of children birth to five. So similar to other states, we have capacity, we had capacity issues pre-COVID um, and those capacity issues are sh shrinking as a result of COVID. So in January uh, of this year, there was a bill that was introduced, uh, Bill 2543, and it, the goal was to have 100% of our three and four year olds um, having access to early learning opportunities by 2030. Um, it was introduced as part of a package. It was packaged with minimum wage, um, affordable housing, and a facilities bill. So it was a really nice package to look at how do we support um, our families in a, in a really wraparound holistic way. Um, and it had, by, it, it had support from the Chair of Budget and Finance, um, Education Committee Chairs on both the House and the Senate side, our business community, um, and then our early childhood partners. This is where we ran into some issues. So this is how a bill becomes a law um, in Hawaii, the Keiki edition. And we ran into issues right at the beginning. The bill got introduced. Um, it was introduced by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative, which is a, a body of business CEOs um, that really started to understand how critically important access to childcare was for the business community. Um, and, but there were problems with the bill. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that. Um, the key players, as you can see here, the implementers are in the middle. So we have all of our state departments, our boards, but really the, the change makers in this and where this is different from previous efforts was the, the commitment of the legislature and the commitment by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative or our business community. Um, at the time before COVID, uh, they had committed significant funds. Uh, they said they would match up to 200 million. So the state would put in 200 million um, the legislature and HEC would, or HEC would match the state, um, which was, we've never seen that type of money um, being committed, which was really exciting opportunity for everybody. But we ran into some problems. Um, the bill, there was lots of issues within the bill. I'd say one of the biggest ones is it would propose to dissolve our executive office of early learning. So you can imagine the uproar. Um, so we were asked to bring parties together um, to mend relationships, to strengthen the bill, and to enhance transparency. So we brought all those parties that I just showed together over two months uh, to really get the bill to a place that was um, in a better place to get passed. Um, the tensions were around relationship tensions, so the blame, shame, authority questions. Um, we had substantive tensions around the balance between rapid expansion and quality, threes and fours versus infants and toddlers and our ongoing workforce shortages. Um, and for today's conversation, especially, I wanted to highlight the, the six goals that were in the bill, but specifically the um, goals around using um, creative solutions for space. You know, Hawaii is very dense, densely populated, especially on our island, Oahu. And so looking at how do we, what spaces can we use? And so we, we started to get creative with looking at facilities. Um, so we were looking for spaces that are already state funded or currently have space available. Um, since COVID-19, opportunities for outdoor spaces and business on-site childcare have also emerged. Um, we're, one of the um, key elements of the bill was looking at libraries. We have the only statewide system, library system in the nation with um, 51 branches on six islands. Um, there's also, we're looking at Imiloa Astronomy Center in Hilo as a place, it's a museum and it's also a place of learning 
um, for school age kids, but looking at using that space for early childhood as well. Um, the Honolulu Convention Center um, is, is underutilized uh, and so looking at and centrally located. And then the other, the fourth area was Aloha Stadium, which is a big stadium with a very large parking lot and a lot of opportunity for co-location. Here are some of the big components of the bill. Um, it has shifted now to 2032, given COVID, um, but implementation of a statewide KEA, um, requirement of accreditation within the first seven years of receiving funds, expansion of subsidy, creation of positions, and then the standing up of a Department of Human Services grant program for providers. But then March hit, um, COVID hit, and the legislative session was stalled. Um, we continued to bring partners together to design the implementation framework and pilots and to advocate for the passing of the bill. Um, surprisingly in July, uh, the bill passed. We were so excited. The other bills in the package, facilities bill passed, which stands up a separate facilities agency in the state. Um, and, and the early learning bill passed. Um, unfortunately, it didn't pass with any money because Hawaii, you know, as most states, was hit very, very hard financially because we're so dependent on tourism. Um, and so we do have small funds uh, that I'll share just a little bit about. So the current efforts are really focused on planning um, and also implementation of some immediate pilots. Um, some of the opportunities we see is this is really the most comprehensive early childhood bill passed in Hawaii. Um, pathways for implementation, planning can begin. Um, if Biden and Harris win, the bill positions Hawaii for a portion of the 775 million proposed for universal pre-K. Um, we have government and philanthropy commitment and that's really um, transformative. Some of the challenges are funding the mandates, um, potentially further silos, siloing the early care and learning um, community, meeting expansion and quality benchmarks without jeopardizing either, and then recruitment and retention. And I just want to end on, um, you know, this year has been an interesting year for everybody. And I, I think this bill was an interesting one because all great changes uh, are preceded by chaos and, and we've known nothing but chaos this year. And I, it, it, it really has highlighted as, as we try to figure out in Hawaii how to reopen our economy it's really spotlighted the critical importance of childcare and we are not going to be able to open our economy without it. Um, and so I do think that that was one of the key reasons that the bill passed um, is that extra pressure that was put on the state um, due to COVID-19. So with that, if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Great, Carrie, thank you so much. And um, I love the, that last slide about all great change comes from chaos because um, let's hope that happens for the whole early care and education sector, um, not just in Hawaii, but um, that's a great reminder for all of us. So at this time, I'd love to have our panelists come back on screen. We have about 10 minutes left for questions and people have been asking some really great questions. And one of the ones that I wanted to highlight um, and maybe we could start with Kristen on this is what do you do when the neighbors say, you can't put childcare here, it's too noisy, can't do parking, it's gonna mess up our neighborhood as opposed to like enhance our neighborhood, which we really believe it will do, but what are some strategies um, for you know, working with neighbors to ensure that we can cite childcare? Well, this has been a problem both for family child care home providers who are always in residential neighborhoods um, and, and for larger programs. Uh, in, we, have, we have the bill that passed in California that went into effect in January that prohibits uh, cities from preventing any family child care providers, small or large, um, in their, to provide in their homes. So that, that does help, although it may not um, eliminate all of the complaints. Um, certainly um, helping neighbors understand ahead of time when this is being planned, what the real impacts are and for example, on the, the traffic and parking issue, uh, because more people are familiar with school arrival 
times at, at large schools where you have a, a set start time when 300 kids all arrive at once. People need to understand that typically a child care center, if families aren't actually living in the same, the housing project where it's co-located, uh, that families are coming and going over a two to three hour period, early morning and mid to late afternoon. So just helping neighbors and, and officials, whether it's planning commission um, who need to approve a project or even the city planners, um, as well as city councils or county yeah. supervisors to understand Thanks. how childcare really works. Yeah. Thanks, Kristen. Susan, you wanted to add? Yeah, this is where co-location of childcare and affordable housing can actually be a strength because the same entities that need to approve childcare are the same ones that need to approve affordable housing. And some of the objections are the same to affordable housing as they are to childcare. And so typically when we build affordable housing, we have a deep community engagement process, especially where there is the NIMBYism. And this is where um, early planning can allow both teams to join forces and really educate the community about the value of childcare and affordable housing, not just for um, the community and the residents who live there, but also for the local economy and local businesses. Um, so I think there's a lot of case making that we can do together. Yeah, that's great, wonderful. Um, I know some questions had come up about cost. And so I was wondering, and I know some of you have addressed these in, in, in the question and answer um, portion of the, the written portion, but if each of you could think about like, if you could change one thing or if it could be one funding source that would enable better co-location and, and increase in access to early care and education, what would it be? Why don't we start with Juanita? So one funding source um, that will help make this more possible and accessible. Um, well, one of the things that we've been really discovering with our, through our well fund and all the technical assistance we've been providing um, is really um, a gap in business su supports for the early learning provider. And um, the early learning field is often seen as sort of this, um, you know, an educator, a space that is there to serve children and families that are offering wonderful uh, services to, to the communities that are making changes. And they are doing all these wonderful things and are providing safe spaces and educational spaces for our children. And I think sometimes we also forget that these individuals are business owners as well. And um, oftentimes they are working with very, very complex subsidy systems um, and just financial budgeting and performance. And so um, it's, it might not mirror your normal small business owner look. And so I think that one thing that would be super beneficial uh, for this type of co-location would be to really focus on providing more supports to the provider as a business owner and make sure that they have all the supports that they need, um, whether it's uh, technical assistance, guidance, funding, um, to help make sure that their business model is sustainable. Yeah, great, Juanita. Anybody else? I think one thing that we've experienced the last nine months is really that critical state leadership um, I think our philanthropy partners were willing to match, but they wanted to see the state commitment first. Um, and because state is responsible for, for affordable housing and for a lot of other um, services, um, I, I think the state commitment is critical uh, to lead out front um, and then to have other partners come alongside. Um, I also think there's ways of leveraging federal dollars um, for a lot of this work. And, and one thing that we're piloting is shared services to Juanita's point to take off some of that pressure of childcare um, so that we, have, that we have a shared entity that is looking at the admin and business supports um, of our family childcare and our small providers, especially our small center-based providers so that they can do what they do best and that's educating our little ones. Um, and that they have the subsidy support, the attendance support, the budgeting support, you know, um, contracted, which I think is a, a better, a better business model. Yeah, that's great. Susan and Kristen, 
Can we hear a little bit more from the, we heard great ideas on the, on the early care and educator side. Let's hear a little bit from the developer side. What are some of the incentives that could really help um, make this not just a project by project um, uh, enterprise, but something that could be a much a broader way to encourage co-development? Um, I, sorry, I can take that on. I mean, you know, the financing of facilities is what I like to call a little bit of a Rubik's cube or a layer cake. Um, we're layering in everything from the low income tax credits that are used to fund the actual um, apartment building and the retail space, new markets tax credits, if they're available, local CDBG funds, um, loans, grants, bake sales, as I like to joke, and we're still coming up short. And so, you know, I, I agree with what Juanita said and what Carrie said. I, I wish that there was a more of an institutional and sustainable funding source. And I also think that um, while low income tax credits are their own sort of natural incentive for affordable housers, I'd like to see a little bit more teeth in that, um, that they're you know, we, we play to um, competition. So whenever we build affordable housing, there's usually competition and the best pitch that gets the most points wins the deal. And so a lot can be changed by giving extra points, bonus points, um, additional sort of incentives to specific um, uh, amenities that a municipality or a government wants to see. Um, so I'd like to see a little bit more incentivizing and a lot more, um, we have to back it up with some additional funding, whether that's through direct gap loans or um, through tax credit, um, additional tax credit benefits. Great, thank you. I love how Susan said, we have to institutionalize support for early care and education. It goes so much more beyond bake sales. And I think that um, Carrie's example of Hawaii having the you know, business community and the legislature both get together and say, our economy is not moving because uh, you know, childcare is not happening. So we must support early care and education and not just to make sure that it can operate, but that it actually has a place to operate and thinking about innovative um, ways um, to, to co-locate early care and education. Susan? I, I also just wanna add, sometimes I think about wrong, what I call wrong door funding. Um, and I'll give an example, like um, we, we have a childcare space that we are trying to fill uh, that's attached to a transit oriented development. And typically when we think about government participating in childcare, we think about businesses or the planning commission or CDBG or loans, things like that. But I sort of see TOD co-location as actually an environmental benefit. And so sometimes I wonder if we need to start getting more creative about thinking about Department of Transportation funding or yeah. other kinds of institutions that, that may be more open to seeing the benefit of having a family live, work, and care for their children all in the same community. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. I uh, We need to end. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. A big thank you goes to our speakers, Juanita, Susan, Kristen, and Carrie. I want to remind everyone that the recordings of all the webinars are that are part of Investing in the Future of Child Care Initiative are available on LIFT's YouTube channel. Also, please watch for the follow-up email that will include a link to the survey. We want to hear from you about what we should be doing next. I also want to give um, a big shout out to Erica and Paolo, who helped us on the technical aspects of the webinar, as well as our SF Fed partners, uh, Laurel, Jocelyn, Jessica, and Naomi. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you for joining us.